Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to our Breaking Barriers panel. My name is Fatu Samba. I teach screenwriting at DePaul University with a focus on writing for television. And with me today, I have the incredible Sahara Jahani. Thank you so much for being here. We're very excited to have you. Thank you for having me. This is such yeah. an honor. Seriously. <laughs> this is really, I've, I did not get into DePaul, really? fun fact. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so whoever's listening from admin, um, look at me. Next. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I wanted to get that joke in. And, and, uh, I'm glad. I'm sure we're going to have like uh, meetings after this. Like what happened? <laughs> Damn it. I know. Somebody go find my application and get it back. Oh no. <laughs> well, look at you now, right? So. I'm no hard feeling. No hard feeling. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you still uh, graced us with your presence, even though even though that happened. But we're so excited to have you to kind of introduce you to the students, to the world. Sahar Jahani is an Iranian American writer and director. She worked in the writers' room on Golden Globe winning and Hulu 824 series Rami and 13 Reasons Why. In 2018, Sahar wrote and directed Just One Night, which is an award-winning short film that premiered at the LA Film Festival and her original pilot, Uncovered, received the 2019 Macro Lab Episodic Grant and is in development with 20th Television and executive producer, Eva Longoria, which is awesome. Sahar also adapted the novel Aisha at Last for Pascal Pictures and was listed as one of Hollywood's top new writers on the tracking boards young and hungry list and she's currently writing on the final season of the bold type so congratulations on all of the things that you're doing and working on working on it's been a busy few years for you and i'm sure you're doing a lot you're writing a lot and so are you exhausted yet <laughs> are you able to have fun and just kind of enjoy this moment or has the stress of it all kind of become overwhelming yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I, I wonder what life would be like if it, there wasn't a pandemic. I think it's stressful for everybody right now. So I just want to acknowledge that I'm very, very fortunate and privileged and lucky to have a job in this time. So I'm never going to complain about being busy. Um, I, I love working, which is maybe a problem. <laughs> um, but, but no, I am, I'm a little, little fatigued. Uh, I did some back-to-back -back projects and was in back-to-back -back TV shows, which I've never done before. And to me, there's always this anxiety that I'm never going to get the next job. Like I always have to keep going. So that's just like how I was, I think, um, brought up in the industry is that you, your next job is never guaranteed. And so there's a sense of like, you, you have to keep hustling, you have to keep going, but Maybe at some point I'll feel comfortable enough to take a break or something. But but I do have fun. I want to say I, I do have fun. I'm not like crazy. I'm not like the president of Hollywood. Like I'm not. I'm just a regular young writer, and I'm very fortunate to be where I am. So yes, I'm good. I'm good. Good, absolutely. And so, how did you kind of get here? Right? Did you always know that you wanted to be a writer? How did you, how did that kind of become your passion? And how did you finally break into the industry? Yeah, I think this is a question that everybody wants to ask, and everybody wants to know the answer. But unfortunately, I hate to burst everyone's bubble. There is no one way to become a writer. Um, there's no one path. This is not med school. Sorry to all the kids whose parents want them to go to med school. Um, there's just not a trajectory. Like everybody has a different journey, but I think it's important to hear origin stories. I, I would ask that question every time I went to a panel because I was like, how do you break in? How do you get in? Um, and I'll say I, I didn't always want to become a screenwriter. I didn't even know that was a job. Um, again, I come from an Iranian family, as you mentioned, and there's this immigrant mentality of like, you have to become a doctor, lawyer, engineer. I think we all can, can attest to that. If you come from an immigrant family, there's um, obviously this pressure to succeed. And, you know, the creative arts aren't part of those like success measures, you know, like nobody in my family had ever done the arts and they didn't even know how to get in, let alone like anybody in my community that I really knew growing up. So I actually wanted to be a journalist. That was my major in college. I studied literary journalism at UC Irvine, go anteaters. Um, I know it's, it's a, it's a great mascot guys. It's really fun. Um, 
And when I was in college, this is, I'm going to date myself, but it's 2000, it was like 2009 when I started. Um, and at the time, like journalism was kind of dying. There was no podcasts. There was no social media, really. Like we had maybe Instagram, Twit, the beginnings of Twitter, right? But nothing to the extent that we have now. So people were like, you got to get out of journalism. Like you go find something else. And the fun, funny thing is <laughs> I thought film would be like my backup major. Like, let me just do this because I live in LA. I was going to school in Southern California so I could potentially get a job in Hollywood. That was my idea. And I, I just ended up falling in love with the storytelling. Um, I've always been a TV fanatic. I love television. I love movies. And you know, when you're a young kid who just watches movies, your parents are like, uh, you're just a couch potato. <laughs> you know, there's not, there's not a sense that like this can be a career. It's just like, you're, you're being lazy. So, so I always was like, oh, that's, you know, that's like a pipe dream. Like nobody becomes a writer. Um, so I ended up in production. I actually started working at YouTube Space LA, which is this production studio, or it was in, in Southern California. And I helped YouTubers make content. Uh, now that sounds really weird because they're like influencers now, but at the time they were YouTubers and I worked with people like Lily Singh and PewDiePie and, you know, Logan Paul, like all those people before they were um, kind of really big or at the height of like their YouTube careers. And I would help um, produce stuff. And I really did kind of come to understand digital media. Like that was the big thing at the time. But I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to produce. I really want to be in the creative space. And I want to help make TV shows. Like TV is still my number one medium. It's the thing that I love watching. Um, and so I got lucky and I ended up working in scripted development at YouTube Originals, which was like the Netflix of YouTube. Um, it's called YouTube Red now. There's a lot of changes. <laughs> As you can see, the industry changes very fast. But I was a coordinator, which meant like I would read all the scripts. I would, you know, help my bosses kind of identify fun projects and good projects to green light to make into shows. And um, the great thing was I learned all about the business. I was the person who all the agents and the managers would send the scripts to. So I got really good at like knowing who's who and what's happening. I knew everything. Like I knew what was going on. Um, for example, like The Wilds is a show on Amazon, right? Right now. Um, I read that script like four years ago and I was like, guys, The Wilds, it's amazing. Like we got, we got to get this show. And I remember everybody was bidding on it to try and get it. So you know, that was really, it's fun to see those things happen now. Um, and we had some great projects. We, we greenlit Cobra Kai, which is like now the number one show on Netflix. Um, we did a series called Step Up. And the point is I got really good at like reading scripts and doing coverage and understanding what it means to be a good storyteller. And I thought I was going to be an executive. Like my path was kind of already set up to go in that direction. And I, I really loved being it being on that side of the, you know, the side of the table. But at the same time, I was reading scripts and not really seeing anybody who looked like me, um, who identified as a Muslim woman or an Iranian American Muslim woman, whatever you want to call it. And I just felt like there was a huge gap in the market for our stories. Um, and no, and I didn't know any, any writers who were doing that. So I ended up getting an MFA in screenwriting. I went back to school fun times. Um, I was working and going to school at the same time. And for two years, I just wrote, I just wrote and wrote and I wrote some terrible drafts and some good ones. And I ended up with a pilot, which is generally what you need in order to get into television. You need like a sample or a spec script or, you know, an original pilot. Specs are not really, I say spec script, like an original pilot. Specs are not really a thing now. Anyways, we can talk about that. But um this pilot became sort of my sample and I uh, was very nervous, but I showed it to my boss. Uh, again, big comedy guy, right? Uh, and he was like, it's good. That, that's, that's what he said, which he never says. He never says anything is good. Um, and that gave me the confidence to kind of take it from there. And I ended up um, applying to a bunch of fellowships. Like, you know, there's a lot of diversity programs in Hollywood. Um, so I did Film Independent, which is where I made my short film. And then I learned that Rami was getting his show greenlit on Hulu. And I 
sort of weaseled my way in with the agents. Cause again, I was the person who the agents and the managers would come to. So I knew all the, the reps and I gave my script to an agent called Danny Alexander, who is now my rep. And I was like, Danny, get me into that room. And uh, he did. And the rest is sort of history. That's how I got my first start um, in TV writing, which was very scary. I left a career that was supposed to be very stable and very lucrative as a, an executive to become a writer, which a lot of people do, or they or they leave like an agency to become a writer. And that's one way, this is the long answer of getting into a writer's room. There's tons of other ways to do it, but I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're very much right about that, but I think it's, you bring up a good point of you know, because a lot of people that graduate from college or grad school start out as assistants and development coordinators and stuff like that. And the job is really you're reading scripts, you're writing coverage, you know what I mean, to really understand story. Um, and I think that's very important. And I'm sure that kind of helped you too in your own writing, right? Because you kind of already had that, that foundation. But you touched on this a little bit, um, but I would love for you to elaborate uh, because films and TV shows kind of play an important part in how people view themselves, how other people view them. Um, and that often has real world ramifications, which is why representation is so important. And so can you kind of talk a little bit about the depiction of Muslims on screen kind of throughout, you know, you growing up and seeing things on television and the types of roles we often see Muslims in? Why do you think Muslims are depicted a certain way? And what do you think are the kind of best ways to go about changing the narrative? Yeah, that's a big question. Uh, I'm gonna try to answer from my perspective and I'm not a historian or like I did not pay attention in media studies <laughs> history section, but I will say I took a, I took a class on Muslim, Muslims in cinema, which is very rare. Like those classes don't actually exist. And I was lucky enough that at my school, we had a professor who was Muslim and he was really interested in the portrayals of um, Muslims and Islamophobia in, in the media. So it, it, it goes a far ways back to like the silent era. <laughs> and I won't bore everyone with that, but I mean, if, you, if you've ever seen the silent movie, you've probably seen like the harems and the sheikhs and the, like that's the depiction of the Middle East that we usually see um, from like the 1920s. And then I think this image of the Arab has become synonymous with Muslim. And that is completely false because most Muslims in America are actually African-American. So black people are actually the majority of Muslims in America. Um, and that never gets talked about. Um, and across you know, the globe, there's lots of different kinds of Muslims. So I'm Iranian, I'm not Arab. And I don't say that because I hate Arabs. I'm just, it's a, it's a fact that I, I'm not of that race. And I, I like to make that distinction because I think it's important. Uh, there's also South Asian Muslims, there's Asian Muslims, there's like the, the largest population of Muslims in any country is in Indonesia. So like, those are just like facts and we don't see that represented in our history at least in North America. And unfortunately, in my generation, um, the event that kind of solidified our, our image in, in the media was 9-11. And to me, that was a, a huge blow in terms of how Muslims are depicted in, in the news, in TV shows. It launched a whole slew of, I think, severely problematic shows like Homeland and 24 and these sort of like, let's get the terrorists, let's get the bad guy type of shows. Tyrant is another one. Um, and these were really, really hard things to come back from. I mean, I think we have a whole, we're, we're starting now with like millennial culture and Gen Z culture to kind of get rid of these stereotypes. Not entirely, but I've been watching a lot of TikTok. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's how uh, bored I am. No, I'm kidding. But I've been watching TikTok and Muslim kids on TikTok are like so lit. Like, I'm sorry to use that gross word, but they are lit and they are teaching. <laughs> they're like <laughs> teaching people about Islam in like a funny, interesting way and, and an entertaining way that I, as a writer, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so inspired by these young kids who are taking ownership of their own identity. So I think we've come a long way. We still have a lot of tropes that we need to assess and that's where I think having a Muslim writer in a writer's room is really important. I mean I'm working on a show now that has a Muslim character who's been on the show for four seasons 
and they've never had a Muslim writer. So I'm coming in trying to like smoothen things out, make things better. And they're like, oh my God, like, why didn't we have you, you know, four seasons ago? And I'm like, I don't know. I, w- I was here, but um, I think now there's, there's no excuse for networks and studios to not have representation in the room. They're just, there's just like no way you can get away with that now, especially if you're doing a show that has different kinds of identities and representation. So um, I think people are just more conscious now. And I think that social media has a huge part in helping play that role. I mean, uh, I think people will get called out. So I think the fear of getting canceled, the fear of getting called out is helping with this. I, I hate that it comes from a place of fear, but it's genuinely like how the business works. It's like, uh, you know, money and fear. <laughs> That's pretty much what happens. So um, we have a long way to go, especially with Muslim women. I mean, honestly, kudos to like Rami, who I, I love and I worked with, and I, I have a great admiration for that show. But there was a lot of issues with the female representation, and I'm, I'm very aware of that. Um, in season one, being one of the only Muslim women in the room, I was very conscious of that. Um, and I think we have a long way to go to, to see a hijabi or somebody who looks like me in a, in a role where they're not continuously debating or doubting their identity. I mean, I think that's important, but I think we can move beyond like the girl who falls in love with a white boy or like the girl who takes off their hijab who doesn't like it because she's getting, you know, harassed. I mean, those stories are valid and they exist, but I think I just want to see like a story with a regular Muslim girl who doesn't have to deal with like hatred, you know, I just want to move beyond that. So that's my goal to normalize us in in entertainment and storytelling. Yeah, that's a great point. And just going off of that, um, and then to your point too, of like Muslims are different. Most Muslims in America are black. Um, I was raised Muslim, you know, my parents are African. And, you know, as we've discussed, kind of the depiction of Muslims on screen does not reflect necessarily our experience. And so what do you see as your responsibility as a Muslim storyteller, like once you're in the room, do you feel a burden to represent everyone and to reflect them in an accurate way? And how do you kind of deal with the backlash from people who may feel that you got it wrong and you're contributing to tarnishing the reputation further? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the burden is real. Like, I, I will not lie. I mean, there, there's a real sense that like, if you're in a room and you know that there's a Muslim character, I feel like I have to talk about it. Like, I'm not just going to sit back and let people talk but I I also re- recognize that and you guys have to understand like a writer's room is a very sacred space and um, people want to be heard and validated and like there should be healthy debate like it, it can't be like you're just shutting people down so I think there's a balance between like being the Muslim person in the room and knowing how to uh, represent versus like being the annoying person who's shutting everybody down because that doesn't represent you, you know? Mm -hmm. So you can't be like, this character shouldn't um, do X, Y, and Z because I don't do X, Y, and Z. You have to come at it from an emotional place and and make it about storytelling versus like, oh no, that's not how we do it in my culture or my religion. I mean, you can point out like things that actually are inaccurate. I think you should do that. But I think there, the sense of responsibility comes from a character perspective. And I feel that about all the characters that I work on, not just the Muslim characters. And I've been in rooms like 13 Reasons Why where there wasn't a Muslim character and I loved it. Cause I was like, I don't have to, I don't have to like worry about that, you know? But in most cases I've been in a room because of my background and I, I wanna get to a place where I think you have to be, con- it's not about being conscious of just representation of your own um, self, but also everybody else. Like if you're a brown or black person in a room, you're most likely speaking for all other people of color as characters because you're the only one. Um, and, and and now, it, I mean, of course, like you have colleagues and, and everybody's very like aware, but I do think that there's if you if you see something, say something you, like you got to say it about all the characters, not just one character, right? So I do think there's a burden to be conscious um, and not just when it comes to race, ethnicity, but like disability, um, religion, obviously like, uh, you know, 
in terms of gender, like representing gender roles. You don't want to, you, you have to, I think it's about co- being conscious on, across the board. And so I'm just trying to be a better person and a better human. And I think that goes um, in terms of all storytelling, not just when it comes to Muslim storytelling. Does that answer the question? Yeah. And to elaborate on that, you've kind of mentioned this idea of when, you know, we finally see ourselves on screen, it has to be, and especially when it comes to Muslim, the perfect image of a Muslim, like a good, you know, what what that means. And so how do you kind of work around that as well? Of like, what does it mean? Because it means different things to different people, right? We're not a monolith. And so how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, there is this urge to want to have good Muslims on screen. And I quite frankly, don't know what that means. I mean, we're all human, we all make mistakes. And in storytelling, the point is that there's conflict, right? And that is the big point of drama is that there are choices to be made and there's conflicts and you know, you're know, you trying to get your characters from point A to point B. Um, so I think if you had the perfect person who never made mistakes or, or never does anything wrong, then you quite frankly don't have an interesting character. But I don't mean that, I don't think that Muslims and anybody, like any identity, the character's identity is not their conflict. I think that is a big like missing point in a lot of these um, new shows and uh, with new characters that we see on screen. The problem is that a lot of the times we make their conflict their identity, and that's just kind of boring. It's like saying a white person's conflict is because they're white. Like, like you don't see that with white characters, right? So why do we put our ourselves in that sort of box of like, because they're Muslim, this has to be their conflict in the story. I think the point is that we want to create nuance and we want to create layers. And so it's like, okay, they're Muslim, they're female. And then, you know, their, their issue is they also have like um, issues with their sister and they can't graduate college. Like there's, there's layers. And so I think when we, I think we can, we're, audiences are smart and we can sniff out when things don't feel interesting or nuanced in my opinion. And so that's what we're feeling right now with, the, with representation. I think people are just asking for more and I hold myself, you know, to that standard. Like I'm catching myself in rooms now where I sometimes I'm like, oh, maybe she goes to the mosque, like the Muslim character. And I'm like, wait, I don't, I don't even go to the mosque. Like, why, <laughs> why, why, why am I like trying to make this person like, you know, something that I want to see? Like, let's just make them real. Let's make them human. And, and that's where I, I um, find myself sort of, you know, creating cliches in my brain. And I have to catch myself a lot of the times because I am very aware of what people want. But I think what people want is to be relatable. Um, I think that's why Rami felt relatable to a lot of people. Um, maybe not Muslim women necessarily, but like the wider audience. And it made it made things like just feel real. And that's the kind of emotion that I want to live in with my characters too. So speaking of this you know, depiction and of Muslim women on Rami. The first episode you wrote for TV was for Rami, the Do the Ramadan episode. And I think there's this misconception that like once you make it into the writer's room and you get to write your episode, you have a lot of power and you can do what you want, but it's not your show, right? So can you talk about kind of how, what a writer's room really works, what the process is of writing an episode and your episode specifically? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a big important note, especially for college students who are like, I'm going to write an episode of television and one day it'll be mine. Like nothing is yours until you run your own show. I guarantee you that. But that's not to like say that I didn't have influence in the room or I didn't speak up or I didn't say stuff. Um, I was also a writer's assistant. So I want to clarify, I I wasn't even a a staff writer. I was an, an assistant who got an episode and was able to go to set and, you know, be on, on production and be involved. So I, I got very lucky in terms of my involvement, um, or I worked hard. I don't know, whatever, uh, (laughs) luck, hard work, who cares? Um, but I, I will say like, it was tough because a, it was our first time. It was my first time in a writer's room. I was still trying to learn how to, how to be in that space and how to be open and vulnerable and, you know, share stuff without, again, knocking people down or, um, you know, getting your point across and pitching I've learned is a very, very hard thing to do. So 
a writer's room, the way it works, guys, everybody in the audience, there's like 10 people in a room, maybe more or less. You meet up every day and now it's over Zoom, which is even worse. And you essentially sit there for like eight hours and you try to pitch ideas on the show. And for the first few weeks, if you're on a new show, you're trying to build out the characters, build out the world. Um, and so it's a collaboration, essentially. This, this process is, is very much a collaboration. And at the end of the day, your showrunner, your creator gets to have the final say and the final sort of voice in the room. So the show, Rami, is, a, is you know, the showrunner and the creator is Rami. And so at the end of the day, like his POV and his um, perspective like one over everybody else and so I, I just kind of want to make people aware of like how these things work and there's like power dynamics and 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 there's you know just a process to how things get written and so even though sometimes I didn't agree with some of the stuff that was on screen I voiced I tried to voice my concern I tried to voice my perspective but at the end of the day like the best pitch and the best story ultimately wins and so and and that's very subjective like to me I, I think I have good stories right but to someone else their their perspective is very much their own and they can they can say no this is the best version of the story so it's interesting how that works like now I've learned in writers rooms the way to like win over a story is to just have the best pitch and to really be confident, even if you don't know what the hell you're saying. <laughs> like, it's so funny. You can, you can tell when people are just like winging it, like they're just like, I'm going to go for it. And so there's a sense of confidence that comes from doing it over and over again. And I feel like I'm finally getting to a point where I, I do feel more confident in my voice and my perspective. So that's just how a room works. And I I recognize that there was things in my episode that people found to be very, um, I guess like, I don't know, I don't wanna put words in people's mouth, but um, Fatu, what was the reaction? Like there's there's a female character who, who you know, at the end of the day, like sleeps with a, with a Muslim man. They're both Muslim. Takes off her hijab in front of him. Hijab. And yeah. she's, you know, she's very, she's somebody we haven't seen before. So I actually, I, you know, I had the same concerns, but I'm like, this is storytelling and this is a character and it is not out of the realm of possibility that this, this married woman um, has, has feelings and maybe wants to act on them. And so she, I actually think she has a lot of agency in that scene because she's the one who offers. I don't know if people have watched the episode, but you guys can go watch it. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> they sleep together at the end and it sort of sets off Rami on his journey. Um, but will I, what I will say about season one, I can't speak for season two. I did not work on that, nor am I working on the show now. But um, I do think there was this domino effect of women coming into the main character's life and it's set, setting him off on a journey. And that is a trope within itself, right? It's called the manic pixie complex or whatever manic man pixie thing um I don't know somebody some film person throw it out but um that is what we did and we ended up not recognizing it until you know a little bit later in the game and being like oh this character just keeps doing the same thing and that in itself to me is not good storytelling and you want your character to go from point a to point b and to kind of have like this kind of trajectory right so I think it went more like this <laughs> um and so that's just you know that's just storytelling. So you, you got to recognize it. Yeah. And so the opposite of that kind of now you're writing on the final season of the bolt type, uh, a very different show, and you've described it as sort of like a dream manifested. And so what drew you to the show? How did you become staffed on it? And what has your experience been like working in the room? And how does it kind of differ from working on Rami? Yeah, I'm still working on the in the room. So I can't speak too much. But I'll say, sure. when I first became a writer when I was writing in grad school, that was the first time I saw a Muslim woman really as a as a reoccurring character in like a type of show that I would watch, like the bold type. I don't know. I'm I'm a I'm a huge like rom com person, guys. I'm a dramedy person. <laughs> if you don't like the show, just keep your opinions to yourself. But I love that show. And I was like, oh my God, there's a Muslim woman and and she's queer and she's also like proud of being Muslim like those two things are always conflicting in shows and movies like you can't be Muslim and be gay like oh my god you know and so th it was the first time we had seen such a strong powerful character in season one come to life um and then I and then I began to notice some discrepancies like you know 
and now I know why, like now I'm on the other side and I know why those things happen. But I think this is sort of public knowledge that like the character is, they don't identify where she's from, but she speaks Farsi in the show and the actress who plays her, Nicole Boucheri is, is Iranian. So that was also exciting to me Indians as like Muslim characters in television. Again, it's always Arabs or South Asians. And so that's what made it exciting. But then, you know, they don't say where she's from. There's no specification. And to me, specificity is the most important thing. Um, I actually think if you're more specific, the more universal you can be with your storytelling. And so I think the show just got kind of lost in like who this character is and where, you know, what does she represent? And she became sort of an amalgamation of all these things. She was like super Muslim, super queer, but also like, you know, took off her scarf in certain times when you're not like, it would just became confusing. And I, I think it became very obvious that they didn't have a Muslim writer in the room. And so I say it's a dream manifested because I, I wanted to work on that show. Mm -hmm. And I will say I interviewed once uh, in 2018 or 2019, right after Rami, I did not get the job. And then I interviewed again in this past year and I got it. And I, I don't know what changed. I mean, I think again, you know, this is again, public knowledge, but the show got called out on Twitter for some of the stuff they did in season four. So I won't, I won't shy away because the, the showrunners also don't shy away from saying like, we made a mistake and we didn't have enough people of color in the room and we, we've never had a Muslim writer. So we need a Muslim writer and we need to bring back this character and we need to give her a final like goodbye and a proper story and, you know, figure out who she is. So I, I do give them a lot of credit for trying to bring somebody in. Maybe some would say it's a little too late, but at the end of the day, I think people are trying and I will be there to help support them and and it's been great in terms of like listening like these are showrunners who listen to my voice they they trust me I mean I can't say what we're doing obviously because we're writing but like it's been nice it's been very nice to be in a space where it does feel inclusive and um yeah the show is interesting because it's on it's talking about things that are happening in real time so it's sort of a hit or miss, right? Like sometimes they're really on the nose and they're really hitting the mark. And sometimes like things change and the world changes and then you have a pandemic and um, yeah. So it's, it's interesting to be writing on a show that's gonna air like six months from now, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. Yeah, and I, what I love about The Bold Type too is um, just the depiction of female friendship which I think is really important on the show and which I think that they do really, really well on the show. Like it always comes back to the three women, which is great. And I know it's important for you in your storytelling. And so what I know you can talk about is Just One Night, your award-winning short film. You wrote it, you directed it. And so can you kind of talk about why you wanted, like what it's, what it's about for people yeah. that haven't seen it and also why you wanted to tell the story? How does it represent your voice as a storyteller? Yeah, um, again, I made this short in 2018. So it's a, it's a, it's been a while, but my dream for myself was to have a story about two Muslim women who are friends and you see them have fun. And yes, the conflict, now that I say it and I'm using my own words against me, their conflict is about identity, but it's also about their friendship and the choices that they've made. Um, and it's a, it, they go to a bar for the first time, um, seemingly for the first time and secrets are revealed and their relationship is put to the test. But um, I just want to, wanted to make a colorful film that felt real. Like I've been in situations as a Muslim woman who's very clearly Muslim and I would go to bars and parties and you know, there's in Hollywood, there's parties all the time. This is pre COVID guys. Um, <laughs> And there will be parties in the future. And, you know, everybody's always drinking and I don't drink. So it just, I felt very uncomfortable in these spaces. And I think going to bars and partying and drinking is such a part of like young and just in general American culture and Western culture. And I felt very uncomfortable as I was growing up in these spaces. In college, I didn't even go to like any parties. I was an RA, so I would like shut down parties. <laughs> and and so I, I wanted people to see like what it would be like to walk in to those spaces from my perspective. And um, that's what the short is about. So if you go to my website, saharjahani.com, you can watch it. And 
yeah, I, I just, again, wanted to showcase another side of Muslim women. Mm-hmm. That's not, not just like a suicide bomber and be like oppressed woman whose father wants her to get an arranged marriage. Ooh. Sorry, but those are our <laughs> tropes right now. That's what we have to Dang work it. with. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's very, very important. You've touched on this a little bit and you know, you talked about working on 13 Reasons Why um, that doesn't have a Muslim character. And you know, most of the time writers are hired based on their talent, their writing ability, but also kind of what they bring to the table, their unique perspective and what they can offer in the room. And so do you ever worry that you do get pigeonholed as like the Muslim writer and that people think that you got hired because you're Muslim and not necessarily because of your abilities and that you've earned your place? Yeah, I think about that all the time. I think about tokenization. I mean, let me be um, honest, but without hurting anybody's feelings here. And Fatu, like you're amazing and I love you. But even this panel, you know, my panel is, is, is about representation. And sometimes I get hurt that like, I can't just be like on the panel that's about like sci-fi or romance or whatever comedy, like that's what I am. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a comedy dramedy writer. And I hope like one day I don't have to do these panels where you know, I have to talk about representation, but it is important to me and I, and, I, and I do it out of love and I'll keep doing it. But like, I did notice like all the other panelists had like really fun topics and <laughs> mine was like representation. It's okay, it's okay. I just thought about it this morning. And- I thought about it too, actually. I thought about the irony of it earlier today too, of like the Muslim writer has to come on and talk about it. But I also know that it's important to our students, particularly that, that are minorities, the kind of, because it is, a part of our experience and you know Absolutely. trying to break in in the industry and stuff and we don't get a lot of people that can talk about that and bring that perspective and so I totally get that thing and I was thinking about that as well myself. No, it's like, okay and and look we have to we have to talk about it and I'll keep yeah. talking about it um secretly you know wanted to be on a panel with Chris uh the guy who did Halt and Catch Fire but you know it's fine I love that show it's okay no I think we have to talk about it it's it's really important and um, I'll keep doing it as long as I need to but I hope that the industry gets to a place where we can just be writers and we can yeah. just walk into a room but but I recognize that I am one of very very few people and so um that is just something that I have to deal with <laughs> and I will continue to deal with it. But, I, you know, and that's why I want young Muslim women and brown people and black people and POC folks to be writing and I will help anybody I can because we need you, we need your voice and we need everybody to kind of grow with each other. And I think it's, I think it's important. So I kind of forgot the question and I will, is that, I don't know if I'm answering it. <laughs> no, it was just about this thing of being pigeonholed as oh, a yeah, Muslim yeah. writer and then- yeah. But I, I, I was worried about that a little bit. I mean, that's kind of the reason, like I did go on 13 Reasons. It's not particularly a show that I loved, right? But I love teen, teen shows. I love drama. Um, it was a very, very uh, interesting show to me. There's a lot of questions about morality. And, you know, this, obviously the suicide became a big topic of conversation, but I actually think it's about mental health more, more than just a suicide or a young girl being, raped like it's about mental health about what young people go through we ended up writing an episode about um gun drills in schools um you know just stuff that felt very relevant to me growing up and so um i felt that way and then now i feel like i'm just gonna do stuff that matters to me like i'm just gonna write stories that i care about and not worry about the representation of it all but also you know I do recognize that if a character is Muslim on a show and they're like scrambling to find a Muslim writer and I like the show, like, I'm not going to say no to that, you know, and I'm not, I'm going to take on that responsibility. And I hope that we can have more Muslim writers coming up, you know, through the ranks and, and so that there's a lot of us and we don't have to like be the only one, you know? So um, I think it's happening. I think it's going to be a great future. Yeah. And thank you for that. Um, I have students who would like to write more inclusive stories and accurately reflect the world that we live in, but they're kind of scared because maybe they don't know enough, uh, they don't have the experience and they don't want to offend people. And so what is your advice to writers who want to write outside of their demographic, but they don't know where to start? Yeah, it's a really important question. And I feel that, I feel it. And I think it's important to recognize that um, as a writer, they say like, you know, 
in rooms, we say this all the time, like a writer should be able to write anything. Like you just should be able to like do it. But if you're, if you're writing a story about a very particular subject or a character and an identity that you aren't a part of, I do think it's important to A, ask yourself the question of why am I writing the story? Like, am I the best person to write this? And if I'm not, or if I am, like, why me? I think I always ask the question, like, why this character? Why me? Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, like, you know, whiteness has become the norm, right? That That's our default mode. And like, I can write a white character, but like, they can't write me. So I think it's it's about making sure that you're doing your research, you're finding people around you who can help you write this character if, if you're if you have to do it if you if you want to be I think you know a good example of this is like having diverse casting in terms of like an ensemble right if you're writing an ensemble show like the bold type you have you, you know you have your white characters your brown characters so like in that space you want to make sure you're representing all those people in the room but if you're writing a movie by yourself and you're like I want to make sure I'm being inclusive, then I think it's about just talking to people who are around you, having people around you who can maybe help you with that voice is helpful. And, and one like tip, don't ever try to like write dialogue and like black voice or like brown voice. <laughs> I think that is when you um, completely lose people. And unless you like talk that way as a writer, like I, like that's my biggest and, and I do this a lot too like some I found myself saying like the Persian characters have accents and I'm like why did I just write that why do the Persian people have accents like just write normal write as you would write any other person and make sure that the storytelling is coming out in your writing and not so much like the description of your characters if that makes sense hopefully yeah, and I think that's super, super important. And also just focus on the humanity of your characters, right? right? And not necessarily focus on their skin color or their religion or whatever it is first, but what makes them human? What kind of universal emotions do we share and how do you bring that into your stories? Okay, final question before I open it up to the students. Um, you're starting out in your career, right? But I believe obviously that you have a great and flourishing career ahead of you. But what is like your ultimate dream? Where would you like to see yourself like 10, 20, 30 years from now? Because you're going to be a role model for many. And so what kind of mark or legacy do you like to leave behind as a storyteller? Well, that's very kind. I, I don't, again, like I said, I have a fear of just getting the next job, but thank you for saying that. Sure. Um, I just, I, you know, it's so funny. I don't, I don't even know, like, I just want to keep making stories and, and writing and, and directing, I, I do love directing when it's my thing. Like, I don't wanna direct other people's stuff. But I think like the best pieces of work that we've seen in the past few years, just thinking about like the 40 year old ver version, right? Um, which is Radha Banks's like uh, premiere film on, it's on now on Netflix, but I saw her film at Sundance and I was like, oh my God, like she wrote it, she directed it and it's so much her voice. Um, if I can do, something just one one thing that feels like this is truly me and it's truly like something that I'm sharing with the world that we've never seen before like I will I will be happy I, I don't want to make like a hundred million shows I, I'm not trying to be like Greg Berlanti here but like I just want to do one thing that feels good to people and feels emotional and relatable and like just human like you said so if I can accomplish that in my lifetime I will be okay Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so let's open it up to questions. Um, Laura would like to know, what was your experience like when writing for Third and Reasons Why? And do you have any advice for writing about controversial and sensitive subject matters? Yeah, it's interesting because I came on that show also in the last season. So I was learning about all the controversy as I was joining the team. Um, and I learned a lot from them and how they've dealt with the initial backlash from season one. And it's interesting because I think people like, it's so funny. I think social media again has a lot to do with this and news and media. I watched the first season and I was like, this is amazing because we've never seen, I think, the perspective of a young woman in a sexual assault situation. And yes, like, does it does it dramatize suicide and, and tell us a story about suicide? It does. But I, again, more so it's, a, it's about the mental health aspect. And I think what happened with that show is like, 
one person wrote an article or like one report came out that suicides increased after that show came out. And the, the crazy thing is that people just ran with that coverage. Like they, they didn't look at the report or who had done it, but just really, really took it to an extreme. And I think I think like we, you know, it was really interesting because we had all the conversations, like we talked about it. Um, we had experts in the room talking about it. And I think any which way you look at it, you kind of have to do what you think is right um, as, a, as a showrunner. I mean, again, I was, I was only a staff writer. So I'm taking the lead of our, our team and the people at Netflix who um, had a big say in this. And I think looking at you kind of you have to weigh the pros and the cons and and really take take a look at all of these things. So we we did a lot of research and we were like, you know, how how can we tell the best story possible? And I think you just have to tune out. You kind of have to tune out the the media and this hype um, because I think if you really believe in what you you're writing and it feels true to everybody in the room, it feels true to all the fans who have written about the show and saying thank you for recognizing mental health and for recognizing me um, as a young person going through these problems that that really helped us kind of acknowledge like this show does mean something to people so I think that if you're writing that something that feels about something that feels true to you um, and it's an issue that you want to talk about like keep writing hopefully it'll it'll relate to somebody else who's going through that similar issue great so Maeve Schmidt would like to know, being a grad student, I have been a part of many different workshops and have found that the easiest way to quiet a room is to try to bring up something that you find to be a stereotype or something that could be deemed offensive toward a particular group. So in a writer's room, how would you suggest confronting problematic or offensive pitches, especially those that are pitched with ignorance? I, we just, we talked about this, right? But um, it's hard. It's really hard, especially if you're the only person of color, or again, you're the only person who thinks that this is a problem and nobody else is speaking up, chances are most likely that somebody else has also found it offensive and they just don't want to say anything. So the way to combat that, again, because this happens all the time, and I, I, I would hate for anybody to become labeled as like the angry brown person or the angry black person or the angry blank, because that's what it would feel like if, if people keep getting shut down, even if idea is problematic and it probably is it 100% it most likely is. I think it's a, like the way that we address it um, in a, in a, in a room, how I've thought about it is like thinking about the, how you pitch it and, and just, and being, and not completely being like, I'm sorry, this is problematic. Uh, you kind of have to explain why. And, and that's, hard emotional labor that we have to do sometimes. But the the way to get around it is to have other people who can support you and back you up. And hopefully there is one other person in that room who can be an ally. And so that it doesn't always come from the POC person in the room, right? Or the other in the room. Hopefully you can, you have enough conscious people who can help you bring, raise awareness. And then if you're coming at it from a emotional place or a character place and you're like hey I don't think this character actually would do this because they've had this thing happen to them and actually in these situations like this happens I think bringing up a character or an emotional or like um, obviously if you all if you're also like Iranian and they're just saying something wrong about Iranians you can be like hey like I actually I'm Iranian and I, I don't think that's true and, and you can say why but I think to always be like shutting people down over and over again without really explaining or or really having people come to understand why is is sort of the problem and that sucks it sucks to have to do that so many times but this is the kind of work that must happen and uh if you don't feel comfortable saying something in the room uh take people aside and, and talk to your boss like on the side and be like hey like i i think like we're kind of talking about this you know, in a weird, in a way that makes me uncomfortable and you can make it about you, not about them. If it makes you feel uncomfortable, explain why. And hopefully it'll be an emotional thing for them that they're making somebody feel uncomfortable. And then if that doesn't work, then th this person is just not um, empathetic, right? And they have no empathy for you. And so that's a toxic situation that I've very much been in. And sometimes you just got to get out of that situation. So 
there's levels to it, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of going off of that, but in a different role a little bit, Sa Sachi Leith uh, has a question saying that my experience in creative spaces has often been as the only person in the room of my identity, which comes with a lot of pressure and sometimes feeling really isolated. What's your advice on how to change things once you have your foot in the door? Um, can we, I, I was reading the comments. <laughs> can we say the last part of that question? I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> What's your advice on how to change things once you have your foot in the door? Okay. Okay. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, look, I think we're all always going to have problems, right? Like we're always going to have things that are not working in our favor. Um, that's just like the way things are, but I think things are changing. I've, I've found that I'm not always the only person of color now in these spaces. And hopefully that'll keep diversifying as we continue to go on. Um, I think it's about raising people up with each other so that there's more of us in these situations. Like I, you know, I, we, we created a group called Muslim Women in Film and Television. And I just started a Google group with my friend um, we just put all of the names of the Muslim women we knew who were in Hollywood, not just writers, but just like anybody who had any connections. And we just talk to each other. We, we try to lift each other up, um, try to get each other in rooms, try to get each other jobs. And I think that's the way you create change is by giving opportunity to somebody else in your purview um, who, who is underrepresented and not just your own people, right? Like I've connected to a bunch of women um, and these panels actually, a lot of people reach out afterwards. And, you know, sometimes there's an opportunity that comes up and I'll put somebody up for an assistant position and we just got to get people through the door. And once you're there, I don't think you have to wait until like you've had some form of success. I think we should always be working towards uplifting everybody and each other. And so even if you're a staff writer, there's still ways that you can be um, a source of opportunity for others. Like I was always aware of like the assistant roles in our office, like a writer's PA, writer's assistant. And I've tried to get people into the room that way. Um, mm -hmm. So even if you're a staff writer, even if you're a lower level, whatever position, you can always be on the lookout for opportunities for other people. Um, and you don't have to reach a certain level to make a difference, I think. Thank you. Akram Shibley has a question. Hi, you know, Akram. <laughs> I do know Akram. I, I credit all of this to Akram. He actually helped me get on this panel. So thank you. He sure did. Shout out to you, Akram. Thank you so much. And so his question is, any tips for writing good dramedy? Do you focus on the drama and find the humor within or vice versa? Um, I always focus on the character and their POV and their story before I add any like humor. My humor, pa I actually write humor like all the way at the end. It, I pretty much do like, what is the story? Like, let's just figure out what this character's emotional arc is. And then you can add humorous situations to in infuse or inflect that that emotion um, or bring out that emotion and then you'll do like a humor pass and do jokes and you can keep adding but if your story from the beginning is not there and there's no like emotional arc for your character because even in a comedy your character has to go from point a to point b so you always want to make sure that exists before you add some stuff in there and he knows this i think he's just throwing <laughs> me a fun question thank you akram you're a superstar writer you already know these things <laughs> thank you akram Okay, Anisha Wilson would like to know, what are the biggest similarities or differences that you see telling stories in journalism versus telling stories through TV? Well, I never worked as a journalist, to be honest. I had one internship at OC Weekly Magazine back in 2010, and I just never went back. But I, but I finished my major and I, I did a lot of articles. And the interesting thing is I did literary journalism, which is magazine kind of long form feature writing. So it was always about story. It was always like in-depth, like creative storytelling that just happened to be based off of real life. Um, and I love those kinds of things. Like I watch docu-series like none other. I'm so glad it's now a thing to make docu-series and Netflix has made it huge. Um, but it's sort of interesting because it's all kind of crafting story in the same way. There's always like 
act one, act two, act three, there's always an emotional arc. There's always a catalyst. There's all, there's like, if you look at any sort of drama, any sort of storytelling, there is a shape that feels familiar to TV or film. And it's all the same. It's all generally the same. So it's very similar. And this is, but journalistic, right? I'm, I'm, but like real journalism, like hardcore journalism is very much based off of facts. So I want to be clear, our media is, is based off of facts. I mean, not, not Fox News, but every, hopefully <laughs> other things. I don't know. Media is crazy. I'm not even going to go into journalism. That's a whole other world that I don't want to get into. Yeah, you're on a different path now. It's, I'm on a different path, thank God. Yes. <laughs> so Jenna Brown, I would like to know, you mentioned earlier specs exist, uh, of existing shows not really being commonplace anymore and original pilots being what to have with you. And so could you please kind of speak more on that? Well, it's two pronged. I won't say that specs aren't are completely irrelevant. Um, I think for fellowships and programs and grants and stuff, sometimes they generally would want you to see a spec just so just to make sure you can capture the voice of a show. And I think that's just important to do anyway, like any basic screenwriting class, I think will make you do a spec um, just because it's it's helpful to like watch a show and and try and create an episode of that show and, and learn the format, learn the arcs, learn how they, how they um, you know, do things in their show. And, and so that when you understand the structure, you can go off and hopefully write your own original pilot. Um, but I think, it's, I think both are important. I, I will say the original is much more um, in terms of figuring out what your voice is and people wanting to see like creativity from you, like they're gonna wanna see a great original pilot. So that is more important to me personally than a spec. Um, but if you have a great spec and you've done it in school, like keep that in your back pocket because if you're applying to these kinds of programs, they will certainly be helpful. Yeah. Maddie wants to know, what is your process for breaking a story and delving into a new character? Does it vary depending on the show? Sorry, say that one more time. I what lost. Oh, what is your process for breaking a story uh, uh, and like a new character? And does it vary depending on the show? Yeah, I mean, in my own, in shows, it's interesting because I've worked on both shows that have been first season shows and shows that have already existed. So it's very helpful to come into a show that already exists because you already know who the characters are and they're pretty much established. But what's more fun is going on a show that's in their first season, they don't have anything figured out. And it's really nice to be there to kind of help shape the characters. I think it's kind of always fun to know that a little bit of you exists in some of these people that you're gonna keep seeing on screen. But for my own personal projects, I would get inspired by real life. Like that is truly how I write. I have to understand and know like this person in real life. I'm not saying I write about my friends because they all think I write about them, but I, or my family, but I, I will take like a nugget of information that I think is interesting and, and then go from there. So like, for example, um, I don't, I'm just going to make this up, but like my friend is a pharmacist and she told me like, that they sometimes skim on the drugs and like, like she'll tell me a nugget of information and then I'll run off and be like, oh, that's, I think that's interesting or that's cool. Or like, I'll see something in real life and um, just be inspired by it. But for me, I have to really know, know it. Like I have to know it. It's hard for me to create something out of nothing. So I'll, I'll have to like experience it or go through it or process it myself. But at the end of the day, it's always like, it's a little narcissistic because there's always a little bit of you in everything that you write. That's just how it's going to be. And so all my characters are just like chunks of me, which is bad. I need to stop writing about myself. Um, but it's hard. I think when you're first trying to find your voice, you tend to write about yourself and then you kind of have to get out of that and be objective a little bit. Yeah. I think that's great advice. So Sachi wants to know what is your dream project? What would you make if you had total creative control? Interesting. Um, I would love to have like a hijinksy um, road trip movie with like a bunch of Muslim women. Um, I've already, like I'm already pitching this uh, to you guys, but like they all go to Vegas and like hijinks ensues. I don't know what it is. I have no other further context, but like 
I just want to see people like Muslim women having fun in like a crazy way that like the hangover felt really fun or bridesmaids, just like how like generally white people have fun, you know, and I, I want to see people of color in those crazy spaces where we're, we're not like explaining things, you know, and we're just kind of living in it. Yeah, I would love to see that. Actually, so. I know if anybody wants to invest in my movie, uh, <laughs> let me know. Okay, thank you. Last question. Tyler Malone wants to know what your favorite Nespresso pod is. Oh my God, I know. <laughs> so embarrassing. Uh, it's clearly the Caramelizo or whatever I have back here. Um, the names are ridiculous, by the way. Somebody tell Nespresso that nobody can pronounce them. So uh, <laughs> it's Caramelizo or Hazel Natino. <laughs> those are the two. Do you need those to kind of get through the hard days of writing? Do they help I'm you? I'm going to have one right after this. <laughs> well, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Sahar Jahani, for taking the time to speak with us today. Hopefully we will have you back and we can talk all about craft and all about the stories that you want to write and tell and share with the world. Uh, we really appreciate you coming and talking about this issue, even though it's not always the funnest. Um, so to send Sahar, thank you, show your appreciation or keep up with her. You can follow her on Twitter, Sahar Jahani, and also on Instagram, search Sahar Jahani and you will find her. Our final panel is next, Writing Superheroes and Beyond with Nicole Perman, moderator Anna Hosein at 615. So thank you so much, Sahar, appreciate you. Thank you and good luck guys. I know the pandemic has ruined college for everybody, but I hope you guys are all still finding inspiration in your writing and your work it's gonna be okay we're gonna get back to normal and if you're ever in LA just give me a shout we'll we'll do a we'll, we'll hang we'll do a social distant hang but hopefully after COVID I'm all and I'm always I'm always trying to be transparent and accessible so if you guys hit me up on social media I'll try to try to respond I'm sure our students appreciate that a lot thank you so much Thank you, Fasu. Thank you for putting this together. And thank you to DePaul University and Brad. And um, I, I, I did not mean to criticize the name of the panel. I love it. <laughs> no, that's okay. I think it's thank important. Thank you for putting this I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> okay, okay, stay safe and warm, Chicagoian. Okay. Bye. Bye.